Ladies and gentlemen, how do I even introduce you, man? <laughs> how do I even introduce you? Long time you? friends. It's uh, Keegan Hipgrave. Um, I don't actually have an intro. I haven't prepared for this one because, um, man, a close friend. We've known each other for... Oh, fuck. Wow. Do the maths. Uh, I think under 11s or 12s yep. would have been. So, man, I remember that grand final. That under 12s in Bur- <laughs> at Burley. Uh, there's a video of me tackling this man. <laughs> it's on YouTube. You can find it. Nah, but um, incredible man. Um, I've known you for a long time, man. Like over ten years. So about well, I'm twenty. We're twenty six now. So mm. that would be what fourteen years. Yeah, wow. So I've known each other for a long time. Uh, it's inspiring to uh, see the journey you've gone on and uh, the different chapters you've gone through and the chapter that you're up to now. So, uh, man, for people that don't know you, man, um, give us a short little rundown. And, uh, and then we can just rip straight into the juicy stuff. Well, brother, mate, thanks for having me. And it's really cool to see what you're doing now and the success that you've had from the, you know, Burley Bears, Narang Roosters days, the Palm Beach Grumman High School ah. days. So, mate, it's really cool to see where you, what you're doing here. Um, mate, short rundown. Um, my name's Keegan Hipgrave. I grew up on the Gold Coast. Um, I grew up surfing and playing rugby league. Yeah. I was a better footy player than I was surfer. <laughs> so that's why I went down the rugby league path. Yeah. Um, Played most of my juniors um, on the Gold Coast, Palm Beach Crumman High School. Uh, Did all my junior development through the Brisbane Broncos. Ended up making my debut for the Gold Coast Titans, uh, which was really fun. I got to do it in front of my friends and family. Uh, I then moved to the Parramatta Eels where I... um, I had a season there, but I was, I was medically retired due to, due to concussion. Um, I had six months off in 2019 when I was at the Titans and then ended up uh, being recommended to medically retire in 2021. Yeah. Uh, throughout that time, mate, I, um, I did a lot of work with Movember. Um, I really care about the mental health space. Um, that ties into the podcast that I started, Keegan and Company, um, which I really want to do a deep dive into not only psychology and, and mental health, but also brain health. Uh, which also ties into to the concussion. So, mate, long story short, um, yeah, we're here now and and we're enjoying post footy. Fuck yeah, man! What a, what a, and obviously there's so much within that story, man. There's so many challenges. Obviously, we've had some uh, we've got some memories together as well, which I'm sure we will we'll, we'll, uh, allude to and we might talk about. Uh, man, like man, I want to go straight to this one. You just you just mentioned it. I, I could imagine obviously for someone who when did you start playing footy? Mate, I started in like under eights. My dad, my dad used to play, but he big old he, Bill, right? Big Billy Bill. boy, yeah. He's still got the stash. He's still got the stash, yeah, mate. He's um he's had a mustache forever. He shaved it. We used to do a um like a November event yeah. um at the end of every year uh, in obviously November um, with the Gold Coast Titans, and we would have a big day at like a pretty much a bar or venue. Uh, we'd get a bunch of the boys up and we'd yep. do raffles but we'd also get them to auction off the moustaches so they would grow it out at the cool. end of the That's month cool. so dry arrow morgan Boyle, yeah. dry whip bread um, and then we'd have all the titans boys there and my dad was actually one of the boys who would shave off his moustache yep. hadn't shaved off his moustache in i don't know like 30 or 40 years Far shaved around. it once for mum's anniversary is there a tan line was there a tan line tan <laughs> line made the whole thing and he actually he ended up getting like 500 dollars for it like i think someone ended up um purchasing the shave off the moustache and it, it, we obviously raising money for Movember and it was a really great night and, and and those things are really cool but yeah mate every everyone that i looked up to everyone everyone who i looked up to in my life had a moustache right so like my old boy my dad had one yep. um my godfather um these like real pivotal guys who I really looked up to all had yeah. moustaches and I was started growing one when I was like 12 yeah. or when I was in probably 10 yeah. you know but and, and they would just take the piss out of me saying yeah. oh mate you're a cricketer side you got 11 hairs each yeah. side or, like, or 12 or whatever it is and then I remember just like oh, I'm, I'm gonna have a moustache I'm gonna have the best moustache one day yeah. and I just kept it mate that's just how it worked I love it man fucking love it Man, let's, um, I'd love to know for someone who's been playing footy for what, you're 26, so 18 years. Uh, well, sorry, how old were you when you got the medical retirement? Like, I was 24, mate. Yeah. yeah, 24. So that's, um, man, that's over 10 years, like over 10 years of your life. Um, loving it. I'm assuming or, or 15 years of your life. So, man, I'd love to know for someone who, and for, for someone that doesn't know Keegan, go watch his, um, his, um, his highlights, go look at the not way many, he plays. There's not many highlights, <laughs> man. You try, though. I, had, I had a couple of tries. Oh, yeah, yeah. My two highlights was getting sent off twice and me kicking oh, the, the chair. chair. Yes. And the, yes. And the Car- other... Carlos and the, was sh- shared it around. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the other highlight was um, doing like a wrestling tackle on Payne Haas where I like end up, it looked like I was humping him. Yeah, epic, and epic. that the brown cardigan clipped that and that went viral. So, mate, Fantastic. I didn't have many highlights, but they were, <laughs> those were the two. Well, 
for anyone that knows you well, knows the game well, seen you play, and for someone who's obviously had the pleasure of playing alongside you and against you many, many times, you're someone who uh, you, you love to have on your team and you hate diverse. And you're someone who plays hard, plays tough, you'll give it to you, you'll, 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 you'll slip a cheeky elbow there, here or there. But off the field, you're the nicest fucking person on the planet, man. Thanks, uh, you're, you're, you're a genuine guy. So I wanted, to ask, I wanted to frame that. For someone who's so passionate about the game, passionate about what you do, what you do, you do well and you give your fucking heart to it, whether it's surf life saving, whether it's um, your, your schoolwork. I know mum was quite hard yeah. on your schoolwork. Mum's been like, Les, right? That Leslie, yeah. Leslie. Yeah. Um, but and to be 24, doing the game that you love, it's probably what you saw as the next sort of foot maybe 10 years of your life five to 10 years of your life what was it like man getting here in the news of like recommending that you retire what was that like for you man it was wild mate yeah it was wild like going through my career i was i was pretty competitive and almost a pretty aggressive yeah. player yeah. um i remember carl lawton would always say like for his teammates I'd be like is he sweet like he's just so, <laughs> he's so angry all the time on the field uh, and he's like no he's the nicest guy off the field he is. you are though like, you mate, are. Uh, the... thank you brother <laughs> thank you no i i think i got that from um a really close family friend paul harrigan are you for those family friends. Yeah, yeah, family. mate. We used to holiday every every Christmas together at Crescent Head. We yeah. we grow up. We'd be playing touch footy on the beach. We'd be surfing. Um, I'm really good friends with his his um, son and daughter yeah. and other son. Yeah. Um, but like just a great family, and I really looked up to Paul. Not only the fact that he's probably one of the greatest players in the NRL, yeah. like ever. He was an Australian player, captain the New South Wales Blues, yeah. captain the Knights. Um, but he was a hard player. Yeah. Like he was a really tough player. Um, I've had some obviously really great conversations. He, he reached out when I was medically retired, but he was someone who was tough, but he had the respect of everyone in the team and was such a genuine, nice guy off the field. And I remember seeing that and I was like, that's, and I think between him and like my parents, I just wanted to be like a good person. And I wanted to have everyone else's like probably best interest at heart. Um, and that's why, I don't know, you, I guess I guess I'm lucky enough to be around some really great people, and um, and I think that sort of rubs off on, on myself. But yeah, mate. So yeah, obviously really competitive, but um, want to give back and want to help. Um, my mum's a, a teacher, and yeah. she used to teach a lot of my school friends, yeah. and all of them would just say to me as I was growing up, it was reinforced all the time. It's like your mum is the nicest person in the world. Yeah. Like um, she's so caring, she's so nice. Like she just wants what's best for me. And my yeah. old boy's the exact same. Yeah. Take off the shirt off his back for you, like yeah. whether it's you know lugging brick or helping his mates do a deck he, used yeah. to, he helped me put a couple of veggie yeah. gardens in a couple of my Epic. places i see that on the stories yeah man. so i love my co cooking and veggie i love yeah. it but anyway like to answer your question getting back to being told i was medically retired yeah mate it was tough yeah. like of course i i i wanted to play i lo i liked rugby league i didn't love rugby league yeah. like I, lo I i really enjoyed it i loved the competitive atmosphere um i liked that we were around our mates i liked the fact that we were fit i liked the team bond i, mate, I liked the core of it um but it wasn't a full obsession. You know how people get really obsessed with rugby league? Yeah. Um, that it wasn't a full obsession, um, but I, I, I really enjoyed it and I wouldn't change anything for it. And I, but I did want to play into my 30s. Like yeah. I wanted to be the guy who played over 100 games. Yeah. I wanted to play State of Origin. Yeah. I wanted to do all that. And then when I was sitting down with the neurologist for the second time, and we've just been through all the testing, you know, yeah. you go through head scans, you go through uh, literacy, numeracy, problem solving. It's a whole day worth of testing. Yeah. They go back and reflect on it. And he came back and he's like, mate, um, after reflecting, like, I recommend that you should medically retire from rugby league. How'd you take that, man? Um, mate, it was, I get goosebumps thinking about it. I don't know why, it's been two years now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, it kind of, it like, hearing those words is tough, yeah. like, because you want to play. Yeah. But a part of me almost agreed with him yeah. because I'd seen guys who were older in the sport and they, you know, struggled to articulate their thoughts and sentences. They couldn't remember what they did the day before or that morning. And like almost being a little bit slow and in a fog. And I remember thinking like, I'm a, the same as you, mate, like pretty ambitious guy. Like I want to, I want to learn about the brain and I want to learn about, you know, little things in life. And, um, and I guess that kind of scared me. I guess that kind of scared me. Like I, I wanted to be good when I was you know, into my sixties and seventies. I want to have a family one day and I want to be around for my kids and, and seeing these like older guys and, and hearing that I was like, well, yeah, my priorities is my body and my brain health. So so he recommended it and I, and I agreed. I agreed with him. How did, what, what happened after that, man? Like, uh, I, I, mate, I, just yeah. for context, man, I'm, I'm wanting to hear, how do you process? Because um, yeah. there's, a, there's a book which is right there. It's called You're Not Broken by Dr. Sarah Woodhouse. And uh, it's just a beautiful line that stood out in that book is trauma is unprocessed memories. So when we go through tough times and we have these big emotional events and for someone 
with your personality. Uh, I've got another story that I want to go into with yeah. you, but for that has to be a very pivotal moment. Yeah. For, it's like that could be quite hard for people. You hear of like um, people that go into past footy life, yeah. they're lost, they have no purpose, they struggle to find themselves. Yeah. It's like that could be quite hard for a lot of people. So I'd love to know your way of processing it. That's probably the question it's a I'd great, like to know. It's a great question, mate. Like I, I see so many guys struggle coming out of footy. Yeah. I see so many guys struggle coming out of footy and, and, and I did not want to be those guys, like that guy. And so that's why I did a whole bunch of stuff throughout my NRL career. Like did a Bachelor of Business halfway through an MBA. Yeah. Wanted to do my psychology degree. Um, but I realized that Mate, if I was to kick stones for the next year, two years, mm. five years, where's that going to get me? Yeah. It's not going to get me anywhere. It's the it's the exact same with, and I think that's probably the best trait that I got from rugby league was resilience. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I can't do anything about it. I can't I can't f- mend the fact that I had you know multiple concussions throughout my NRL career. But what I can con- what I can control is where I'm going to go, mm-hmm. what I can be doing, what are, what are my lifestyle habits. Beautiful. Well, mate, that's like, that's, that's the thing. And it, it ties in back to, I don't know if you want to touch on it now, but like when, back when I was at Bronx, like I've always had this thing of like, what's next? Like I can't change it. What's next? Yeah. And I think that stems from coming, having past experience where you take confidence out of, you know, like these traumatic events, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be big traumatic events, yeah. but you know, events that, uh, that do change your direction. Yeah. Remember when I was at the Bronx, um, in the under 20s competition. But when I, I signed my first contract at, at 17, when I was at high school, um, I had a four year deal at the Bronx. So from 17 to 21, and it was a good deal. Like I was full time at 18, yeah. which, was, which was rare and, and really great. But I was just hungry to play great. Yeah. Like all I wanted to do was play NRL. And I, I was like, I used to think it was arrogance, like a bit arrogant to think that, yeah. but someone said, no, nah, you were just self-confident. I was yeah. like, yeah, I actually like that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, ta- I'll say that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll say that one. But I remember being 19, um, and I went through this string of um, like tearing my hamstrings. Yeah. Like I, w- I remember I like, and I was like 19, I was thinking well, this is the, this could be the year. If it's not this year, it's next year. Had this thing in my head that like Corey Parker made his debut at 18 yeah. and he bought his first house at 18. Yeah. So I want to do that. Like I, and so my, in my goals is like, I wanted to play NRL when it, before I was 10, 20 and I wanted to buy a house before I was 20. Yeah. Silly, like silly thing to compare myself to. Cause I thought like if, I could do it like that, then I'd have half the career that Corey Park would yeah. have. That's the way I sort of resemble it. Sure. But anyway, I had this um, this string of hamstring tears where I tore my hamstring like five times throughout the season. Yeah. And if it was just an ACL, it'd be like, okay, you're out for six months and you're done yeah. and then come back and you'll be sweet. But it was like, work really hard, work really hard, tear hamstring, yeah. work really hard. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit longer. I'm going to do everything I can, tear hamstring. Yeah. I'm going to go to the AIS and talk to the best hamstring specialists that we can. Yeah. I'm going to spend time with that. I'm going to... Pull the recovery process yeah. out longer, tear it again, yeah. and that mate, it was so mentally draining. I had guys who I really looked up to in the team saying, "Mate, if you're a horse, we'd put you down." Wow! Like, like, and that's the footy uh, environment. Yeah, they're they're, taking, the they're taking the piss. They're yeah. taking the piss. But mate, it really hit me, mate. Yeah. Like, I mean, I got a journal. I should have brought it in. Actually, yeah. I didn't even think about. It. I got a journal that I was looking back through. And I had this like journal entry. Have of, you been like, journaling? For yeah, mate. I would, well, like on and off, mate. On and off since uh, like high school, pretty much. Fuck. We'll get uh, back into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll come back to that. And I and I wrote this journal entry about how like how just upset and how like how I didn't think I was like worthy of playing NRL, and I had these little things, these little entries about. Um, these boys saying if, if you know if you're a horse we'd shoot ya and like Wayne's just looking for an excuse to cut ya like just trying to get in my head Far out, man. and um, brutal and I, it's brutal <laughs> it makes you tough it, but yeah. I wouldn't change any of that because yeah. I get to I can have a really tough conversations yeah. now which is yeah. fine um, but the fifth time I tore my hamstring I remember just being like f- just broken down. Um, I remember I had um, Jack Jack Reed and Lockie Morana, and I think Jordy Carr, who actually I trained with Jordy yesterday morning. He sat in that chair about um, two months, three months ago. What an incredible yeah. person! We yeah. touch on Jordy like his yeah. story is incredible. Yeah. Um, and they just they gave me this big hug, and I remember sitting in the car, I called my old boy, and I'm like, I'm done with footy, like I'm sick, like I can't keep doing this. And dad's like, he loves his footy. He's just like, oh, well, maybe like talk to Clinton. He was my manager, Clinton Schifosky. And then I spoke to Clint and he was just like, mate, you're 20, you're 19 years old. Take a step back. Like most guys aren't making their debut until they're 24, like mid twenties. Like take the pressure off yourself. Like just sp- take some time, like, and just get it right and you'll be fine. And, and, he, and he was like, mate, if you do want it, we'll talk about it. But like, he's like, you're too young to, to have that yeah. mind frame. And then... 
anyway, I took a step out of it, took a step back, um, ended up going to the Gold Coast Titans, yep. um, change of environment. Yep. I was back with guys who I you know, played footy with, like we played footy yep. with, Carl Lawton, yep. Kane Elgy, Ryan James at you, Palmy. You and Carl, I, I don't know you, I don't Carl obviously from yeah, school, yeah, yeah. I don't know your relationship, but from what I've seen, you guys are characters. He's the most genuine, kind-hearted yep. person that I've ever met. I've got so much love for him and he's, any dark times, like he's probably the guy that I lent on the most. Um, and anyway, quite, and then and a change of environment, um, Good timing. I can't remember if it was at Bronx or Titans, but Hugh Van Kylenberg, yeah. um, Resilience Project, came in and spoke to us about empathy, mindfulness, and gratitude. Wow. And I started doing the grateful, great, gratif, grateful journals yeah. where you write three things you're grateful for every day. And I started doing that, and I started I love, to, love I, and I started to see the good, like the good things. Instead of being like, I'm injury prone, my hamstrings are going to tear, I'm not going to be able to do this. I was enjoying my footy, I was back surfing with my mates, um, I was seeing the good in in life, I guess, and and I ended up making my NRL debut at the end of that year. How oh, fucking good, man! Which was cool. Look, I, there's more to you than just footy, but there's so much obviously footy to you. One more story on footy, and then we'll dive into like podcasts and all that stuff. The story that you might not have shared because maybe, oh maybe, maybe not. Let me know. Um, year twelve. We're going for the national title. It's, yeah, uh, we've we've yeah. had um, we've had we had a solid team. Like we had we, we were stacked. We, mate. we had a great team. Yeah, and um, we even from like year eight because we did well. I know we had a couple of losses yeah. against like Marsden and all that mm. stuff. But it was um, said a lot that we could we could do it. Like yeah. we could win the title. Yeah, um, we get to year twelve. We got a solid team. You're our captain. Do you make you make Australian schoolboys that Australian year? Australian schoolboys. Yeah, and we make we win we we make it to the I forget the setup, but we. We make the semis or whatever it is, and we we win. Uh, it was it was up in Redcliffe, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. The game. Yeah. Couple minutes left. We'd won the game. We'd yeah. won. And th- what's the team? I forget the team name. Uh, Wavell. No, yeah. I uh, know no, we played um Hill Sports High. Hill Sports High. Yeah. There's a couple minutes left. We'd won the game, and they were dirty. They were just filthy. Fuck you guys. So. Mr. Keegan, our captain, takes a run up. And from what I remember, I was on the sting. So mm. I didn't come in and join. Sorry, yeah. mate. <laughs> but they, right. they, start, they start punching you. Yeah. They start throwing shots at you. Yeah. And you throw one back. Yeah. And that's just self-defense. Like you yeah. were getting blown at. Mm. You get suspended from it. Mm. And we have our... The national quarter is that mm. right? Or the se- I cut. It was yeah. a, it was a national. We I think that was the national semi. Yeah. And then we were going into the. Oh no, that was the national. Yeah, no, that was the national quarter, and we were going into the semi. national semi. Yeah, so no. we did make it into the national. We semi. made it to the semi. Yeah. You get suspended. Yeah. We go down, and I get it because man, I, I remember the scene. I get the emotions come up from it. It's like we go down and we verse a team, and you're our best player. Like let's say it how it is. You're our captain, Australian schoolboy, and you couldn't be a part of it. I get emotional. I'm like, whoo! So yeah. we go down and we lose. We lose by like I think like four points, and it's like fuck. If we had Keegan, <laughs> what would that look like, right? Oh. But I remember, I remember scenes of seeing you upset. Yeah, I remember seeing the boys, Greenway. Who was there? Jerome Green, Jerome Veve, Keenan. Fuck, I'm trying to remember the team. Uh, we had Kobe, Kobe Anna, they, Kobe he, Anna, he Jack right. Cook, Jack Cook. Fuck. Um, the guys before that were like Luke Garner, who yeah. he's playing for Penrith yeah. now. Like we, it was a cool team. What was it like for you, man? For someone and the, answer the question from someone who, because I've, I've heard Cameron Smith talk about this, like the year. He got uh, he was um, suspended for the grand final and they got dusted. Yeah, like they got hammered. What was it like for you, man? You're our captain, Australian schoolboy. We lose by four fucking points. What was going through your head, man? Tell me, mate. That was such. I I'm so glad you brought that up because that has been out of my mind for so many years. Yeah. I have. And I think I've just fully not suppressed it, but I just fully put it in a drawer and just like locked it away. Yeah. I was so. I was so angry with myself like throughout that at the end, like we'd won the game. Yeah. We'd already won the game. And, and, and I, I remember going back and looking and I threw, and I threw a couple punches. Yeah. So dumb. Yeah. Like I look, and obviously we're young and, and we're dumb and hindsight's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Like if we could have our time back, we, we would. Yeah. And then, and all, I remember going to the judiciary, like, and I was talking about, it and I was pleading, like, yeah. trying everything I could to try and get, like, just to play. Yeah. And the best, because they wanted to sem- suspend me for two games. So yeah. it would have been grand final and semi final. And yeah. they're like, nah, we'll say suspend you for one. So if your team can make it, then we'll make, you can go into play in the grand final. Yeah. And I remember thinking, that's so wild. Yeah. I was like, that's just like a little tester. Like, yeah. and then the boys, you, you flew out. 
and I wasn't we allowed. Played on, we played on Penrith Stadium, right? Yeah, yeah. So and you flew out to Sydney, and I wasn't allowed to. Come, I wasn't even allowed to come. Yeah. So I was sitting in engineering class, listening to it on on the radio because wow. there was no live stream. I don't think wow. back then it was on the radio. I haven't heard this. this is I was good. Si- so I was sitting in the engineering class, and I remember hearing about it, and um, and we it was something like like we were so close to winning, or like yeah. we almost scored on the buzzer or yeah. something like that, and we came so close. It was so close, man. And like. I it remember was just Ethan, being, Ethan Roberts. It was, he was so Rob, close. It yeah. Was so it was like we were five, five, ten meters out. Yeah. And yeah. Anyway, keep going. Back. Anyway, and like, and I hate the fact that like, because Jed Jed Cartwright rang me yeah. straight after the game. Yeah. And a heap of the boys did ring, but I just I specifically remember Jed calling me and saying, like, "Keys, I'm like, I'm like crying, obviously crying. Yeah. So I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry." Yeah. I was like, fuck, like, what are you yeah. to be sorry for? I was like, you boys play, played your heart out. We almost won the whole thing. I'm in tears crying in engineering class with Mr. Hoppet or whoever the teacher was. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking like, oh. I was like, I was like, this is like, it's, but it's a learning curve. Yeah. Like it's a full learning curve. I wish I could learn more. I wish I could take the brain I have now back to when I was 16, 17. Yeah. I probably would have made a few more good decisions, yeah. but like, yeah, it's, there was nothing I could do about it. Um, I, I was upset. I was angry at myself. Um, I felt like I really let the team down, um, and it, and it upset me. It really did upset me. Um, the best thing about it was that I guess we came back. Um, we got to. It was real weird. We played like the state final yeah, after that. Yeah, that, that was interesting. That was hey, a weird that, thing. That was weird, yeah. So anyway, I got to come back and play that, we and, we, that. and we won that. that and so we had a good red state, hey, and we had and we had fun, and we got to celebrate the year. Um, but yeah, mate, it was yeah, just what it is. What a story, man. Yeah. I haven't spoken about that with anyone. Neither have so, I, brother. So. Yeah. Fuck, let's get into it, man. So, get into it. We're already into it. Um, let's go past footy now. So, you're obviously, you're doing um, the podcast. You're obviously paired up. We're, we're both wearing um, the Good Humans Project. Uh, our, our mate, Cooper Chapman. Yeah. Good human. Hooked us up. Here's some Brandon for you. So, he's, yeah, a, go, he's a good man. Go grab some of Go grab some of his merch. You're paired up with Steve from school. Yeah. Um, Steve Dresler. You're part of the What Ability crew. Rocked up, repping the car as well, <laughs> repping the brand. Um, yeah. So what's life now outside of footy? What's the What are you focused on? What What drives you? Like you've had the the structure or the pathway for footy. Play hard, train hard, try keep your career, make origin. Like you had those sort of those paths in front of you. Uh, what was it? What was like kind of the decision or thoughts for you to get into a, end up where you are right now? Mate, I think that I think that ties into to the purpose, like yeah. to my purpose. Like at the end of the day, like I want to. I think I think at the moment it's helping people through sport. Yeah. Like I think I think at the end of the day that's what it is. It ties into what ability. Like we employ a lot of athletes as support workers. We're a disability support service that uses athletes, and um, I get to manage the athlete program around Australia, which is really cool. So I'm not only helping participants with disabilities, their families, but I also can give flexible employment to to athletes who are training at a really high level but need flexible employment. And then we also use guys who, you know, might like there and they obviously do it for an employment opportunity but also like those top tier guys like you know your Tom Javoyevich's you know your your Braden Maynard your Dyson Heppel's guys in Angus Bells from all across the sport and and they do it to you know give back and give perspective which is really cool but it also ties into I guess like the whole thing with with mental health and um I want to I want to be an advocate for mental health like I've I've got so many friends and mates who are who are currently in the NRL now um and he will be coming out of the NRL in probably the next couple of years, five years, 10 years. So I want to be able to have the tools to help them. Yeah. I want to be able to have the tools to help my friends and family and my inner community. That's why, you know, and we can touch on how I got into it with, you know, with, yeah. our, with our mate Regan. Yeah. Um, but at a core, yeah, it's like, I want to have the tools to be able to help everyone going forward. And yeah. so it's a journey, brother. Like yeah. it's, it's cool that, we touched on it. I don't know if we touched on it, but I was the second episode on on this. Yeah, podcast. we didn't say it. At the we start. didn't even yeah. say it. Like so. I remember you reached out and we and we did a podcast at, at the gym. Yeah, and it was number two. Like yeah. on, a, I think we're on an iPhone or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was off a off a. Uh, it was a laptop, um, and it just had like a USB mic where you just plug the US the mic in. No video. There's yeah, no video. No then, video. So. But I me- yeah, I remember doing that, and it's all about the journey. And like, look at you. You're, you're 230 episodes in. Like, and because when we were talking about we caught up we just ran into each other at the airport (laughs) and we just started catching up and reconnected and and you said like oh we're doing the podcast and i was like oh how long you been doing that and you were like mate 
you were the second one on there. I was like, have you still been doing that? It's like, you've been going for four years. Like you've been grinding for four years. And that's probably why you speak so well. It's probably why you're such a great host. But yeah, mate, for me, like tying back into it, it's just the journey. Like what I want to be doing now, I want to be doing for the next 10 years, 20 years. So um, I want to like, that's why I want to do my postgraduate in psychology. Like I want to have a good foundation worth of knowledge because the podcast, mate, I'm not going in there telling people what to do and what and 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 how to do things because I don't know. Yeah. I'm going in there as a way as a vehicle to learn. Like I want to grab as much information out from athletes, coaches, retired players, psychologists, people who have been in that in that environment and then not only have and not only learn, but also break down the barriers and stigmas of mental health because if you've got someone who is recognizable in their field or one a really influential player then if they can be seen having these conversations and so can we, you know what I mean? Like all my role models growing up, like Paul Harrigan, like we were talking about guys like Corey Parker, like these were all, like all my role models were athletes. Yeah. So if they can be seen having this conversation, then so can we. And, and every conversation is going to be different. So yeah, man, I'm really going to lean into the mental health side of it. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, yeah. but I'm just going to start. You're going to figure it out, man. I'm just going to start. Like I, I, I'm only four episodes into into the podcast and I love it. What's the podcast name? It's called Keegan and Company. Um, Keegan and Company. It's like the company you keep, yeah. um, which is which is cool. And a lot of it is just it's just mates, to yeah. be honest. Um, fortunate enough to have a lot of mates who are doing some really cool things in in Australia um, and overseas as well. So, and it's cool. Like a lot of these guys, you know, they might not be you know, comfortable having these, you know, vulnerable conversations with a host or someone they don't know. Yeah. But when you've already had a thousand beers with them before and you probably already had these conversations, then it makes it a little bit easier yeah. um, and makes it, and they're more comfortable and a bit more vulnerable. So yeah, man, I'm going to lean into that and uh, I'm really excited for it. I love these conversations. Yeah. Even like this conversation right now, like I, I get so much energy from this. Yeah. Like I really love it. So right. mate, thanks for having me on. <laughs> thanks for being here, bro. Right. So, uh, Man, something that uh, I have got like five different questions. Um, where to go? Where to go? Uh, you mentioned mindfulness. Um, you've got the pleasure of working with incredible athletes. Um, you've been able to play with some, train with some, be mentored by some, have relationships with some. Now working quite closely with more. How does um? Because like uh, it's it's kind of two questions in one. Like you've got the gratitude aspect. Like you're you're doing journaling. Mm. Um, firstly, where did that come from? Who was that, mum? Because I, I get the loving vibes from mum, yeah, gratitude yeah. vibes from mum. I don't know mum extremely yeah. well. I know her from back in the day, yeah. but who got you into that? Man, I'm not too sure. Hey, like mum, mum was a big advocate for like studying, yeah. like going to uni and having a plan B. Yeah. Uh, but actually, I don't even know where it came from. Like, I think it was just, because now like journaling is a big, like trendy thing Very to common, do now. Very common. Um, but do you med meditate as well? Is I meditate as well. Yeah, I have yeah. to. Yeah. I'll be too stressed <laughs> if I don't. Yeah, um, yeah no, like, I think it was just this weird thing when I was 17 or maybe even 16. I like just wanted to have this leather book, like this leather bound journal. Yeah. And I wanted to just like unload thoughts in the, into it. And I guess th a part of me thought like maybe in 10 years time, I'll look back in the, and think, oh, this is a pretty cool thing. <laughs> or it'd be a really cool thing to see how I'm thinking at that point in time. And going back, like now, like looking back over it, like I think the last, I think I looked at it like a month ago. It's cool to go back and look at it and see how far you've come. Um, because when you're 16 and 17, like the hardest thing you've gone through is the hardest thing you've gone through. Yeah, like like whether you're, you know, 16 and you've just gone through your first breakup or, you know, you didn't make a certain team, like that's going to be the hardest thing you go through. Yeah. But if you're comparing that to someone who's, you know, in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, you might, you know, you might have go through a divorce or you might, you know, lose your job or you might, you know, whatever it is to have a kid with cancer or lose a baby whatever it is and that's going to be the hardest thing that you go through yeah. so in terms of like comparing the two they're both going to be hard yeah. and so dealing with it and looking back and be like wow i can overcome a lot more and once you've had those past experiences and you've learned that you can overcome those experiences it gives you so much more confidence like that's that's probably the biggest thing but yeah how to get into journey i don't know i just sort of like just started it and I'm, but i'm so glad i did because it's such a great way for me to like unload my thoughts and I feel like if they I feel like they just stay there unless I write them down yeah. and if I write them down then I just feel like it's weird it's like lighter yeah. same with meditating mate same with meditating you meditate yeah it's um back to similar to um it's unprocessed memories it's like you're you, we 
we live in such a high stimulus world, like yeah. social media, work, hustle, business, life, relationships. It's like, it, I use the analogy of like, you, obviously you're an athlete, you train hard and your muscles are fucked. It's yeah. like when they, you sleep, you recover. How often do we give our brain the, the room to recover? 100%. And that's meditation journaling. It's letting your thoughts breathe. Yeah. So that's um, I, absolutely, I, I meditate daily. Um, I, I don't journal. I've never been a journaler. Mm. Um, maybe because my handwriting, I can't even read my own handwriting. So <laughs> yeah, that might be why. Yeah. Um, but man, I, a lot of the videos I film, I'm talking to myself. So that that's my kind of my ways of doing it, right? So and you can look ba- and you can look back on a video. Yeah, I um I just got back from Europe. I did um went to Europe for about a month, yeah. pr- just solo, just yeah. a lot of hiking. I love that. Man. I did I did I, love that. I did love do that. a lot of eating and drinking in Italy. I met up with my pa- family yeah. in Italy, which was cool. Oh, you're on the boat. I think yeah, we're on the boat. Too. Yeah, you saw that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we were doing it tough, but I did a lot of like um hiking through like the Austrian Alps and yeah. the Swiss Alps. Was it was sick, and I remember just I was like in the thick of it. I hiked like 19 Ks like into the mountains. There's like this beautiful little cabin that sits on like this lake that the ice has melted down from. It's gorgeous. Like it's so cool. And you can stay and you can like stay there. There's food, like there's wine, there's a bed to sleep in. Then you hike back down the next day. I remember I was hiking up there and I was, and cause when you're, when you're walking, it's, and you're by yourself, it's just, you've got so much time with your thoughts. And so I remember just having like all these wild ideas and like these wild thoughts. And I was processing probably a bit, a bit of, shit that i've you know gone through over the last couple months and i was just like i'm just gonna like record this because i want to articulate it and then so i recorded it and then when i got you were just talking to yourself just talked to myself like put the phone down and i was it was really beautiful because i had like mountains in the background i remember just putting it there and just talking for like 20 minutes and then stripping it putting in the hard drive and i was like i'm gonna listen to that in like 10 years that's fucking cool yeah but it's like exactly what you're doing now like you get to have these great conversations with yourself and with you know with guests mates friends people you look up to and you can go back and look at that like we look back at the episode that we did you know four years ago which is cool what would you say to someone who either whether an athlete or just anyone who has they don't they don't sit in solitude they don't sit with their own thoughts they don't take the time to process to regulate to actually get the thoughts out onto paper whatever words you want to use what would be a strategy whether it's journaling meditation or anything like that but also what some of the questions you would get them to ask themselves to help them process through it i think most most people in sport most people in general probably just sit with it yeah. and, and it builds and I've, I honestly think that it builds up and it just builds up to the point where I know it certainly did for me I, I can't talk for anyone else but for me before I started meditating before I started before I started talking to mates yeah. to be honest like I would just I would build up, build up, build up and have put all these stresses from external but also internal. Like I was putting so much pressure on myself to make the Australian schoolboys team. Putting so much pressure on myself to play NRL and it built up and then I would have this really little trigger event where it might be like, you know, a missus at a time said something bad or you broke up with your missus or, you know, you didn't get the grade you wanted to and that would be my trigger and then I would go in this full breakdown like... um, like downward sort of spiral, like with these gnarly negative thoughts. And I remember thinking like, that's so wild. And then it almost like, I don't know, like I kind of want to tie that into like Regan, to be honest. Like, do you mind if we talk about that? Please, man. That's like, that's kind of like, partly the whole reason why I got into mental health was, was a really good friend, Regan Grieve. Um, He, we were, we, we captained the Queensland, um, like schoolboys team. Um, we both co-captains. We both co-captains. Um, we both got picked in the Australian side, yeah. and this guy is like someone that you look up to. Like yeah. he 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 was, was he? so he was a back rower. Okay. He was one of the best back rowers at that competition. We made Australia, so of course, Could like okay. <laughs> he was he was funny. He was um, well respected by the team. He was always happy, always that fun loving energy. He's a person who like I kind of want to be like, yeah. um, or who I wanted to be wanted to be like when I was a kid. And we we, we roomed together at the schoolboys competition. Yeah. We're at Darwin. Um, we were staying in like this. Like, did you have a national trip? Like, well, you made the schoolboys. Yeah, so the schoolboys. So that, that the, and, you do a trip. And so yeah, so it's it's a six week tour of England and France. Cool. So it's a wild tour. What everyone wants everyone wants to do it. And but mate, the thing was, he broke his leg. He broke his leg um, at that competition. So he got picked in the schoolboy side, but couldn't go overseas with us. Um, I remember link, I remember getting back from the tour. Um, at the end of that year and we wanted to link up with him and my mum actually reminded me of this and she's just like yeah you're going to catch up with Regan but you said um, you said that you 
didn't want to because you were scared of how he would felt because he didn't get to go. You yeah. didn't want to tell him how you had this amazing trip, but, yeah. but he couldn't go. Yeah. Anyway, he ended up committing suicide on Australia Day that following year, mm. which was just fucking wild, mate. Like, um, to be honest, like he, it hit me by surprise. I remember getting the call from Kurt DeLewis. Is that the uh, coach or something? Kurt DeLewis, me, so me, Regan and Kurt roomed together at at, 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 um, at the schoolboys competition yeah. and, and we played a bit of footy together. He was a really good friend of Regan, like a really close friend to Regan. Yeah. He went on to play um, NRL, he yeah. played for Manly, yeah. um, he's played for a bunch of teams. Um, kind heart, he um, he called me and he, he told me what happened. And, um, and mate, it was just like, it was such a wild thing because I was like, how could this guy who's just like respected by everyone, like loved by everyone, from the outside looking in has everything together, but I didn't didn't know. Like didn't know with the internal struggles he was going through, didn't ask about it, like wasn't like wasn't a priority for me. Yeah. And so I remember thinking like, fuck, I'm never gonna let that happen again. Mm. I'm I'm never gonna let that happen. So that was the trigger moment for me where I was just like, I wanna I want to be able to talk to my mates. Like going through the footy, like footy, we're brave and we're macho and we don't talk about it, which is just shit way. And yeah. it's like we talked about, it's yeah. like tie in before, like yeah. it builds up and that's the stress. And then without, without being, I, I genuinely believe through personal experience that the more I talk about things with a few key mates, the better I feel about it. Like anytime, anytime I go through a really crazy thing, like I, I, I call my, like Carl Lawton, yeah. I've got two other best mates who I can really lean on. Yeah. Um, even my family, like um, these, are the, these are the people who I lean on in these times. And I've learned that because I've gone through triggers events. Like I, to be honest, I, um, I suppressed all the stuff with Regan. Like I was a 17 year old kid, like first, like probably really- Were you in school still? Were we in school? We're in, we had just graduated. Yeah. So we graduated that, uh, that, that year yeah. and then, um, 20 when was it 20 2015 is a time when like guys are going through to start their nrl pre-seasons yeah. this is a time where you know you're, you're just coming out of school um and and he didn't get to do any of it yeah. like he's and he had such a bright future ahead of him he i that and that's the thing where i released a i released a podcast i didn't release it sorry i was on um the unlaced podcast yeah. where i started talking about it's it the first time i'd ever talked about regan right. um and they did a really beautiful clip and, and Regan's mum reached out. Wow. Um, I hadn't spoken to Regan's mum in like eight years. How was that, man? It was wild. I, um, I, I suppressed it. I, I didn't go to the funeral. I don't yeah. know why I didn't go to the funeral. I just didn't go. Yeah. Um, my parents were like, we didn't want to bring it up with you because we yeah. were scared to make you sad, yeah. um, which was fair enough. But I just, I just kind of wanted to block it out. Yeah. I wanted to block out all that sadness. And then when um, she reached out and she just like, thank you so much for sharing um, Regan's story um, I was so scared that when he died that his story would have been forgotten mm. and um, she's been great in, in the sector about mental health yep. and she's been a great voice for, for mental health and she's she's an, such an incredible person yep. she's like thank you so much for sharing that we need more people like you and then after I heard that like I, I was like do you mind if I call you I called her we spent an hour on the phone just crying yep. and That's everything beautiful, man. but it was, the, it was the first time that I'd actually like brought those past traumas up like that yep. past trauma um, like it's just wild like how many things we hold yeah. and i was just like so emotional probably under a bit of stress with like yeah. with everything else that was going on and i remember just talking about it. i felt so much lighter after talking about it so no. mate full story to answer your question the question the question was what can we tell like people who are going through to to who might be you know yeah suppressing stuff um yeah, I'm not sure. I'd like my go-to answer is like just to talk to people, yeah. like have a, have a few friends that you can lean on. Um, and I found that once, and I just say this through personal experience. Like I'm not a I'm not a clinical doctor. I'm not a clinical yeah. psychologist. Um, I'd really like to go down that path, yeah. but I I'm only speaking through lived experience. Yeah. Um, so I always say like if you are really struggling, like go see a psychologist, yeah. go see a therapist, go see someone who's properly trained in the yeah. matter. Um, but yeah, talk like leaning on friends and family and. And people say, well, how do you, like, how do you do that? Yeah, that like, was going to be my question. For someone who's come from the macho world, the footy world, yeah. like, they, like they throwing shit at you. Yeah. Like, um, what was the horse thing? Like, you're uh, a horse if, you're a, you. if you're a horse, we'd shoot you. Yeah. 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 So, I was, like, again, a bit of banter, but that shit can hurt, right? That yeah. shit subconsciously can get stored in us. Yeah. For someone who's come from that, which um, I guess, and I'm not generalizing right now, but men generally, from my upbringing as well, lived experience is um, like men don't cry, toughen yep. up, stop being a pussy, blah, 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 whatever. Mm. Um, to be able to have that level of vulnerability, to be able to reach out, what would be 
either just some words of advice or maybe something you've been able to do to help you get over that ledge? What what I've found is that when I'm vulnerable with mates, yep. they're more likely to be vulnerable with me. Yep. It's like it opens a door and it's really weird. And it's like once you've had a vulnerable conversation with someone, then you're more likely to have it again yep. and, you're, and you feel more comfortable to have it again. And it's such like a crazy thing where... And it's hard. Like, don't get me wrong. The first time you have it, it's hard and it's awkward. And it's like, well, like, what do you say? Like, yeah. you're like, hey, mate. Because we're always like, hey, mate, how are you? Yeah, not bad, mate. Yeah, yeah. not bad. Yes, yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah good. Um, yeah. But then I found that if someone, <clears throat> and it might be, you might recognize that they're not, you know, they're not rocking up to social events. They might be a little bit quiet. They might be, you know, drinking excessively. They might be, you know, just not acting themselves. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're having a, like a catch up with a coffee, catch up for a beer. I don't drink that much anymore. I usually go the non-alcoholic routes now, but like, um, but yeah, if you're catching up, I usually like to do it like over a shared drink yeah. or a shared like experience, like yeah. a walk or a training session. Yeah. Um, and then they're like, Hey man, how are you? Yeah, yeah, man, sweet. And then they might ask you how you're going. Yeah. Like, Oh, well mate, I'm actually like, I'm actually pretty stressed out with work. You know, I've been traveling all the time. Like even coming to here to the Gold Coast, yeah. like these, these trips are wild. And when you travel to Melbourne and Perth and all over around Australia, it's like, these these days are packed yeah. like where you're doing five to six catch-ups a day you're presenting to the top athletes in australia you know you're presenting to so many and you want to be on yeah. and then you try and fit in catch-ups with friends and family you don't want to miss anyone and you know you're you're still training excessively and yeah. like mate i'm stressed out like I'm, I'm it's it's a hard time yeah. so being able to communicate with them or be like hey man i've just you know gone through a breakup like just broke up with my missus like just broke up with my fiance and then when you're able to have that conversation, then it opens it up and they're like, oh, well, actually, yeah, mate, like I'm, I've actually gone through this as well, um, which is really powerful, I think. Um, what would you, what would be some of the questions you'd ask someone? So say I've come to you and I say, hey, hey man, like to be real with you, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. Yeah, I just, I'd want to be, and it's hard, like it's hard to navigate that question because like, I'm not a trained psychologist. Like I don't, I don't know the proper answers. Like yeah. that's why I'm going on this. That's why if I, if I'm having these conversations and they mention anything about, you know, suicidal ideologies or um, going down a really dark path, I sh straight away say, go talk to a psychologist. hundred percent. I am not trained to fucking have this conversation. I will, I will like be sort of like inquisitive. Like I'll do it. Like, yeah, I'm going through a bit of struggle. Like, yeah, what, like what's going on? Yeah. Like, oh, you know, I'm having this fight with Mrs. Well, what's the conversation around? Yeah. And like, just uh, just like continue to ask the questions um, because it might help them. Once they articulate it, it might make a little bit more yeah, sense just to them. Process, like processing it. Exactly. But no, my, my go-to, and I, I ref I've got a great psychologist and it takes, it takes, it takes some people a few times like to try different psychologists to find the one yeah. they like. I've, I talk to mine every month. Yeah. I talk to mine every month. Like, because we, you know, we, we talk to us, we, you know, we typically talk to a psych when we're sad. Yeah. It's like, why don't we talk to them when we're happy and we're yeah. going through things? It's like, when you're fit, do you stop training? Yeah. No, you, of course, you keep training. Yeah. And the brain's like... So one going, of the, going to the hospital to get healthy. It's 100%, <laughs> mate, nail on the head. Nail on the head. So like, why, you know, why, why is there a stigma around seeing a psych? Yeah. Well, like, there's no reason to. Like, yeah. I, if someone said to me, I'm seeing a psych, that... For me, that's like they're going to see the dentist. Yeah. They're going to see, you know, a physio. Like there's no difference for me. And I think the more that we can have these conversations and it's, it makes it normal. What do you see yours for? Mate, everything, everything. I, I started seeing it when I was going through a tough time with footy. Um, that was the first how old, time. How old are you? Like back in, with Regan? Um, Regan? No, no, not even then. Yeah, no, like before, yeah. no, sorry, um, after Regan. Yeah. Like that's what I mean. Like I suppressed all that stuff from like my childhood the stuff with Regan, you know, going through, um, you know, the injuries. Like I didn't start seeing one until I was maybe like 21, yeah. um, which was, and I was just lucky to find one that I really liked and really got on with. And I would just talk to her about, <clears throat> it started off like talking through like some past traumas that I was going through, past trauma, um, talking about like where I wanted to go, like my ambitions as well. Yeah. And then when I was feeling real like good, I'd be like, oh, I, I, like little things just start popping up and, and they're really good at like navigating a conversation. That's why it's great to have a relationship with them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd talk to them about anything and at the end of the day, I'd feel, yeah, I feel so much better about it. Man. Yeah. What are you working through right now, man? Like personally, yeah. um, made a few things. Like the biggest thing I found when I was leaving footy is like probably time management. Yeah. Like that's, that's my biggest probable struggle at the moment is... Um, I want to do everything yeah. and, and I found, I found that the hard way, like 
when I finished footy, like I wanted to run ultra marathons. I wanted to do jujitsu. I wanted to be, you know, a really great employee for what ability. I wanted to build the best, I still want to build the best athlete program. I want to learn more about mental health. I want to train. I want to catch up with friends. I wanted to do everything, but you have to learn to say no to things. Like that's what I found. And you probably found that as well. It's like, um, if you want to be, you you can be good at lots of things or you can be great at one or or a couple of things. Um, And that's why I want to go down the mental health route, mate, to be honest. Like, um, and so, yeah, I went through like a really stressed period of like over committing to things. And now I'm like very conscious of like where my time is allocated. Like these conversations give me energy. Like I love having these conversations. Um, The conversations, even like, and I, but I still stuff up. That's the thing. Like I even though I'm, it out, even though I'm still like, because how do you manage your time management? Because you are obviously doing so much with your businesses, with your podcast, yeah. with like, you know, even relationships, friends. How do you manage your time management? Because I'm actually really keen to hear that. Oh man, that's a big can of worms. But um, I do values, purpose, mission, vision. So what are your values? What's yeah. intrinsically most important to you? This is my, again, I, I, I kind of pre-frame before we click record. Like I've got obviously strong views around suicide, mental health, depression, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, for me, like the biggest, for you, low self-worth is feedback that you're not being your authentic self and yeah. prioritizing your needs. But I use the word values and that yeah. comes from Dr. John Martino, who's just there. Yeah. Uh, and so what are my values? What's intrinsically most important yeah. to me? Because it doesn't matter what you achieve if you're fucking miserable. And Regan, spot perfect 100%. example, right? Yeah. So uh, low self-worth is feedback that you're not prioritizing what your values are. So what are my values and prioritize them so I'm the best version of me. Great. So my values are coaching. Yeah. Funny that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah learning wealth relationships health and um friendships right so those are scheduled onto my calendar yeah i train every morning i learn every day Beautiful. i see this as coaching yeah i had a podcast before i had a call that didn't show up i've got a call later so like a lot of my day is coaching yeah and the higher the value the more you need to do to fill that cup up mm. so you i don't obviously I, we know each other but i don't know you super well to this day yeah um but i know you value health so yeah. i know you train more than the average bear yeah um you value learning you do a lot of learning yeah. you value impact i'm not sure what you would categorize as maybe career or impact or mission i'm not sure then your purpose is your expression of your biggest core wound and my and just long story short my purpose is to heal and raise the consciousness of the world because that was most painful to me yeah mission what's the five to ten year goal that we're yeah. going to go achieve so i want to coach and guide one million people to live a life that inspires them which essentially do the work i've done for me and help them do the same thing and then we break that down what do you do in the next 12 months what are your 12 month goals and i've got them i can show you after mm-hmm. this quarterly monthly weekly daily That's so simple. daily uh, daily huddles if anyone hears this do this change your life i've got my dad and brother to start doing them. it's really yeah. cool so number one what are you excited for today get some energy my excitement was to see you yeah. so i'm excited for you today yeah. um so excited for podcasts i also other things i'm working on what were my outcomes for yesterday done or not done and why weren't they done mm. accountability transparency because mm. it when when you and when you have social pr- uh, pressure where you tell others you're going to do it mm. and then you have to tell them the next day you haven't done it yeah social pressure like yeah. you feel shit if you've done nothing and you have to tell everyone you've done nothing that you said yeah. you feel a bit shit about yourself good healthy pressure what are you achieving today and they have to be measurable outcomes what support do you need with them so there's no excuse for the next day why they're not done and what are you grateful for so gratitude to finish it off brother <laughs> i love i love <laughs> i love everything that you just said yeah. i love that you and you break it down into like practical tips or practical yeah. things that people can actually take out because it's one thing to talk about it yeah. but it's another thing to actually this is this is what yeah. i do you give me goosebumps man it's um it's life's happening for you not to you How do you apply that when someone commits suicide, when someone rapes you, when someone abuses you, when you've been abandoned, when your business goes under, when whatever it is. And Mm. I've I've walked through this. I've had a client uh, uh, not too long ago, about uh, about a month ago now, Mm. sexually assaulted. She had never processed it. We go through and I've got a process of how to process it. It's actually in that book right there. And we go through and we process it. And Mm. then that releases that trauma, that weight, that energy that's stored inside of you. Mm. So you're lighter and you're more authentic. Yeah. Your light shines brightest when you let it shine freely, but we've mm. got all these traumas and wounds and limiting beliefs that have been um, picked up through the challenges we go through. We build walls to protect ourselves, but it becomes a prison that keeps us trapped. Yeah. And it's quite a, like you get hurt in a relationship, so then you don't let people in because you want to get hurt again, but then you have shallow relationships. Yeah. So it's learning how to heal through that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and obviously doing the podcast helps me articulate it, man. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a bit of practice, bro. Yeah. So. But yeah, that's 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 how I do it, man. And then um, and I redo it every three months. So every yeah. three months we sit down. Um, so where are we up to? Um, almost up to the ne- end of this quarter, end of next month. Mm. So I sit down, me and Georgia, we block out a whole half a day on a Friday afternoon, yeah. and we chill out. We make sure we got no commitments on. Yeah. We b- go back through. We redo our values as a process to do that. We redo our purpose, redo our mission, redo our vision. I missed out vision. Vision mm. is what your lo- life looks like once you've hit the mission. Yeah. Um, and then redo your plan. So how are you are you on track? 
Have you hit the goals? Have you had, what else is next? So. That's really cool that you can do it with someone as well. Yeah. Like it's a nice, it's a nice exercise and it obviously keeps you accountable, but it's a really nice exercise to go through with someone. Man, I, cool. I saw a couple of these graphs. It's like the amount of time you spend with people as you get older. Yeah. And like every single graph goes significantly down, yeah. like friends, family, yeah. Except for your, kid, or your kids, kids as well, once yeah, they yeah. leave. Yeah. Um, but the only one that shoots dramatically up is your partner. Mm. So as you get, like me and Georgia. Pick uh, the right partner. Yeah, <laughs> that, but that's, it's like, uh, I heard, I've heard people mention this multiple times. It's the biggest decision you'll make for your life is your life partner. Yeah. For that one, that reason being one of the bigger reasons. Like yeah. if you're not with someone who supports and challenges you, that's how we grow. We need both support and challenge. Then um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a pretty big decision. And knowing your expectations, knowing your visions, make sure there's alignment with the visions, mm. and make sure you're aware of each other's values to give each other space to do each other's values. Um, yeah, I can chat about this all day, bro. So this yeah, <laughs> we could set up, we could we could but, do a three to five uh, hour on just on this, but yeah, that's cool. Man, um, I got halfway through one of those questions. Uh, the second part to the question was about all the mindfulness, all the stuff you've learned, um, how people can reach out. How is mindfulness now even... So you grad, oh, not graduated. You you got into the sort of NRL system around 18 years old. Yeah. So that was about eight years ago. Give mm. or take nine years. Mm. Um, what are you seeing now? Because like I'm seeing as a whole collective consciousness, consciousness is getting better. Like mm. people are... Like the shirts we're wearing right now. Mm. There's cool to be conscious if you've seen those guys yeah. around. There's a lot of people that are in this space because it's... Um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's a great thing. Yeah. How are you seen in a professional world, in the sports world? How are you seeing mindfulness starting to improve? Is it is it improving? And if it is, how is it? If it's not, how can you improve it? It's a it's a layered question that I probably don't have a lot of answers for. Okay. Like to be fully transparent, like have I do I see it changing? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like from when when I came into NRL as a as an eighteen year old, yeah. mate, there's not much going on. <laughs> I always I always think about the story when that a question like this pops up is um like i was talking to nico hines nico hines yeah. and, and and aaron booth and and those boys that were in the melbourne storm system when yeah. they won the grand final yeah. um even when um that we were in the bubble in 2020 yeah. and 2021 and we we're going through like you're obviously isolated when you yeah. go into a bubble you're isolated what was that sorry for a tangent what was that like yeah it was <laughs> wild man. it was wild we, we we were in sydney and we came back to the gold coast so i was cheering yeah, guy yeah. Grew up on the gold coast that's yeah. why i was very happy yeah. um but yeah mate they so you're in like a hotel room um or hotel like building yeah. um there was five teams where we were they spread them out between gold coast brisbane and sunny coast yeah. and um and, and you're just in an apartment, you're training, you're yeah. locked away, you've got like a... Uh, <laughs> you're like a little field to play Well, on. we had... A, well, that's the thing. Like we were in we were in like a big sort of like hotel, I guess, where we could like still train. We could yeah. still see everyone. So there was a field there? There was a field there. So yeah. we could still train. We were obviously like gated in. So yeah. no one else could come in. But you're like a prison. <laughs> like, it's like kind of right? It's kind of like <laughs> a prison. It's kind of like a prison. But I remember talking to, to Boothy and Nico about it. And they were like... Um, and uh, Nico, Nico brought it up because these guys they're, they're away from their families like yeah. we're away from our families for a month before they came into the bubble yeah. and what nico realized like nico's a pretty impressive and pretty incredible guy to to think about this obviously because he's conscious of it yeah. um and he's gone through his own mental struggles but he was saying yeah some guys are loving the fact that you know they're away from you know where they were living they're up on the gold coast you know they're they're being around the boys all day it's great but what nico and, and boothy realized was that you know actually probably not everyone's going through you know the same scenario yeah, like they're probably mis they're probably missing their family they're probably missing their kids they might go through their own mental struggles yeah. so boothy got um boothy uh, nico asked boothy to jump in as well but boothy's like mate this is your thing like go do it and so nico pretty much talked to the staff talked to the playing group and was just like well um we're like let's check in let's check in to see how we're going so what they did was they created like groups of five like little groups of five and they had these questions that they would ask each other yeah. and they would go through and pretty much just like talk about how they were feeling yeah. And ties back in is like, do you think 10 years ago in the NRL, like NRL clubs would be yeah. like getting in circles and talking about their, how they're feeling? Yeah. No that. way, oh, yeah. no way. So you look at like how far that's come. And then you look at the people who are doing like the self-improvement, like who are doing mindfulness. Hugh Van Kylenberg is doing yeah. some amazing things yeah. with the gratefulness and mindfulness yeah. and empathy. Yeah. And so to be, I think conscious of is the, is the best thing. Once you're around this, like, man, I don't need to tell you anything you don't know. Yeah. Like you get this stuff better than anyone. Um, but being around 
people who are doing like-minded things like you, like I, I wouldn't have got into meditation if it wasn't for a guy I worked with, yeah. um, Dan, who does some amazing meditation in yeah. Bronte. Yeah. And now he's going to be taking it to Byron Bay, yeah. you know? And so being around guys like Steve Dresler, like the founder yeah. of Whatability, like he, I could see how much he was doing yeah. and how much pressure he would have been onto yeah. and still like have the cool and calmness to be able to execute. Yeah. And I was like, how do you do it? He's like, man, I meditate every day. Yeah. Todd Lubinskis, who, who is a, who's a really great friend of mine, um, who is now engaged to Danica Mason, yeah. um, the um, reporter for Channel 9. That's cool. but amazing people. And Toddy has a really great story of how he was you know, fully stressed out. He was seeing the physical symptoms of stress and, yeah. and he couldn't figure out why his lips kept exp- like bursting out yeah. why he's you know his neck started choking up and why his heart felt tight yeah. and then he realized that it was the stress that he was under he was training Crazy. twice a day like Uncrazy. he was he was going through this un, like you know just been through a marriage breakup divorce like he was going through and i hope he doesn't mind me talking yeah. about this um because he talks about it pretty openly which yeah. i don't think he'll mind yeah. um but he's like yeah it was f- through stress yeah. actually like i found the f- my first i've actually never spoken about this yeah. but like i had my first like bit of physical symptoms of stress like two weeks ago what like three like three weeks ago <clears throat> i remember i was like there was a whole heap of things that i won't go into but i remember like i was i was in bed and i had a big day the next day and i was kind of a bit nervous for and i was, I was scratching um like i was scratching yeah. i felt like i had a mosquito bite yeah. and then i woke up at like four in the morning and my lips my calf my lip had like looked like i'd been bitten by something i was like what's going on and i looked up i had like rash all over me my glands were inflamed wow. Um, my chest was really tight and I was like, what's going on? Um, and I thought of Toddy straight away. And, um, and then, so I was like, okay, what do I need to do? I need to meditate. So I had a sh- cold shower. Um, I meditated, I had a, a tea and it was so weird. Like the physical symptoms yeah. came down Crazy. and, and mate, like, I don't know if that's tied into stress. Like, I don't know Honey, if that, have you watched the documentary heal? Nah, I haven't. Watch that, man. Yeah, yeah. Disease is dis-ease. Yeah. And it, it manifests in the body. It must. It must, mate. Like, it, it's, yeah, it was wild. Have you done Joe Dispenza's work? No. Nah. Man, another rabbit hole for you. Yeah. He's, he's, he's my top three books. My partner's currently reading it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, man, it's insane. Like, he has people, um, blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, people in mate, wheelchairs. Mate, you were telling me that at the airport. It's a, And it's hard to fathom when you hear that. You're like, oh, I know you're open-minded, but yeah. a lot of people are like, oh, that's bullshit. It's bullshit. Yeah, He's yeah. got the brain scans. He's got the studies. Yeah, yeah. Like, the book's literally up on my shelf. Wow. Um, I'll tell you another book that you got me into was Jim Quick. Yeah. What's your experience? I, I hadn't actually read the book, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. but I, I knew I'd been in front of what you said. Mate, you, you put me down a full rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, um, I'm halfway through his book. Limitless. Uh, Limitless, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a mirror just full keep, keep of little... Talking. I've got a mirror of little quotes, um, of little quotes on, on his wall. On my sorry, on my mirror that I that I like to look at um, every what day. Are some of them? Um, mate, you put me on the spot. Let's have a look. Um, it's like your the best one that I probably got is like your something like your greatest weakness can be your greatest strength. Yeah. So this guy, like you obviously know, like he had a he had a brain injury when he was little, and and, and everyone. Sp- pretty much called like that's the kid with the broken brain yeah. and so throughout his whole schooling he thought that he had damaged brain he had learning difficulties he really struggled um and then it wasn't until he flipped his mindset and he gives some really great practical tools um on how to and how to do that and how to be better but it was pretty much like changing your mindset and and it's like the blueprint that you've outlined for yourself doesn't have to be the end destination 100%. and and the lifestyle tools that you do um can change your can change your life and this guy is like has now like one of the you know, best memories. He's worked with guys like Apple and Nike and some amazing companies um, with like movie stars and, and stuff like that about, you know, memory tension, brain health, which is very much aligned with yeah. my concussion, yeah. <laughs> um, which is cool to see. So um, I'm actually reading it now because um, I want to do my postgraduate in psychology and um, I'm not nervous. Like I'm nervous of the volume of, yeah. of, of work. work that I have to do. But I was like, well, what, what's a little leg up? Like how, yeah. how can I train to, you know, to be great for that coming through? Because I want to be able to, you know, retain, retain yeah. um, which is what he talks about. So yeah, mate, thanks for the book. That man, was great. Very, very well done, man. I got a ton for you. Yeah. So um, man, um, I'll start to wrap it up. But um, man, if you, are you going to write a book? I'm not, a, but man, I'm not sure. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it. If you did, what would be your top three pillars to go into the book? Writing a book. I don't know. There'd probably be a few ones. I'd like to do a good think about it, but the first ones that just 
pop out to my mind probably more recently is like, yeah, you're, I don't know, like you're never stuck in what you're like, you're never stuck in what you're doing. Like you could, like you can fully change the direction of your life and, yeah. and people have really narrowing beliefs and, and beliefs that they're you know, not good enough. They're not smart enough. They're not talented enough to do any of that but they're all just a narrative that you've told yourself over the years. And it's not like, it's not the truth. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, if we, if some of our internal thoughts are so gnarly and so negative, and there's no way you would say that to anyone else. So why would you say it to yourself? Yeah. Uh, and so that's something that I'm sort of like going down and really interested at the moment is mindset and thinking like, well, how can I structure these thoughts? Like when I was playing footy, I never thought I was that talented. Yeah. Like I, I always thought that I was the guy who, you know, had to work really hard and be really competitive. I never thought I was a skillful player um, where I wish I changed that. And I wish I like genuinely thought that I was a skillful player and I worked on my skills more. Um, so that's so that's one thing, yeah. um, not being trapped in your limiting beliefs. Sorry to uh, touch on it, yeah, please, because I know Peter, you have some great Peter insights. Crone, man. Yeah, if you he's in the documentary Heal. Yeah, watch the documentary Heal. Mm. Peter doesn't get as much of the spotlight in that as I would have liked him to have, yeah. but he's my number one consumption of content. Yeah. I listen to him like he, he, his um, title is a uh, self-made title is the Mind Architect. And yeah, it's unraveling the beliefs and the layers that we've created through pain through ego through suffering through whatever mm. and it creates similar to what i was saying before it's like you create these barriers to protect yourself but those barriers become a prison that we imprison ourselves in yes. i'm not worthy because mum, because you were the second favorite sibling because you failed a mass test yes. and, you, and you whatever like there's all these things that we take up especially from ages uh, zero to seven where you're the most moldable and most um um coachable and you'll accept whatever information you pretty much tell it santa mm. claus is real tooth yeah. bunny is real whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. so um yeah he'll be a if you want a rabbit hole he's my favorite rabbit hole to go yeah. down is um peter crone but yeah if anyone that knows peter crone you know what i'm talking about Very so. cool. um but yeah that's definitely one the other one's probably resilience yeah. and knowing that things are going to be hard and, cool. and over and overcoming them like david goggins I'll assume. david da <laughs> david goggins yeah yeah um cameron haynes yeah. ned brockman i caught up with ned a couple of weeks ago and he's gonna get him on the potty yeah, he said he said he was going to come on the yeah, pod. Yeah. Um, he said he's got a busy couple months coming yeah. up, um, and he said no to pretty much everything. Yeah. Like, mate, when he when he finished the run, he he could he could have been a millionaire yeah. overnight. The amount of the amount of sponsors yeah. and contracts he had, um, what, but a he, hey, what a feat! What a feat! And such an incredible bloke, like such a good down to earth yeah. bloke. Um, and he's just like nah, all like if the contracts and the sponsors and the speaking engagements and the keynotes, if they didn't align with my why, then we just binned it. Yeah, it's good. like we binned 99% of them. Um, so, yeah. But he did say he was going to come on, so I'm going to hold him to that hold him to back it, end of the year. Um, it, so yeah, yeah, like um, working hard, like and having a having a having like a stack of evidence, like people like, I heard this, I think it was Chris Williamson or Alex Hormozzi or something like that. It's like, um, you don't get... You don't get confidence by shouting words of affirmations in a mirror. You get confidence by having a stack of undeniable evidence to know that you're like you are who you are. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's so yeah. Alec, Chris has quoted it back to Quite Alex. Quite back to Alex. <laughs> and yeah. it went viral when he was quoting it. it was Wild. Really yeah. So that's probably yeah the second one and and the third one probably just like yeah be a good human. I was just thinking it because that's something that stands out with you, man. Yeah. You, like from knowing you from uh, a, a fair while now, you're. You've got the heart to you, but you've also got the resilience to you. And that's the, it's such a beautiful blend in you, man. But continue on your point. Matt, I, I really appreciate that, mate. And that, and that means a lot. Like it does mean a lot because yeah, I, there's just, there's just so much like I want to do. Like yeah. there's so many people I want to, I want to help. I want to help my mates. Yeah. I want to help my family. I'm, I don't want to help my kids one day. Um, and I want to be able to, it's like the, it's like, what is it? It's the, um, the life you lead is the lessons you teach others. Mm. And that's, I think that's a that's at a core. Like that's got to be at a core for for anyone really, for over what you want to do. And everyone wants to do different things, but to have like genuine impact, like you've got to live it. Yeah. You've fully got to live it. Like, um, which is it can be challenging at times. But yeah, no, being like being a good person, it's not it's fucking not hard to be a good person, yeah. brother. Like yeah. it's it's really not. Like yeah. you know, it's I guess it comes back to your family's morals and values as well. But you can you can change that. Like you you have a family, you can change what you want to change, and you can go in the direction that you want to go in. So mate, having yeah, just yeah, probably yeah, I don't know what else to say. Probably just to be a good person. Be a good fucking person, man. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wants to connect with you, man, um, jump, consume the potty, connect with you on social, any athletes listening to this, how they get involved, what's, uh, what's yeah, the best way? Yeah, my, my, my Instagram is Keegan Hipgrave. Um, the, the podcast is Keegan and Company. Yeah. Um, we're on all platforms. Um, you can just Google 
or YouTube or Instagram, any of them. Yeah, and like the th- like I said, I'm more than happy to have conversations with, yeah. with anyone, um, whether that's being athletes or whether that's being, you know, mates or whether that's just being someone who wants to chat. Yeah. Um, it's just a, it's just a start, to be honest, mate. Like we're, we're just starting off and you've got to start somewhere and I think I'm, yeah, I'm going to lean into this for the next 10 to 20 years. And um, so, it, But mate, thank, like, thanks for having me on. This is, um, it's really cool to be able to come back for the yeah. second time and, yeah. and use your platform yeah. to be able to have these conversations because yeah. I think these conversations are really important important um and mate I'm a, I'm a big fan i love what you're doing here i Thank love you, the mate. message you're spreading so mate keep it keep it up i'm very Appreciate proud it, uh last question that i leave everyone with you i've already asked you the question so maybe go a different answer yeah um what is something that you're working on on a personal level that the world doesn't get to see oh that's a good question mate um that's a good question the world doesn't get to see a lot of it, mate, to be honest, probably a lot of it is around like my brain health at the moment, to be honest. Like I don't talk about that too much. I talk about more of the mental health side of it. Yeah. Um, obviously having all the concussions, like I want to learn more about the brain. I yeah. want to go, and I've said it, I want to go a deep dive, but the practical tools is like, yeah, like lifelong learning and learning yeah. new things. Um, trying to stay off the piss as, as much as I can. Yeah. I don't I don't drink that much, to be honest. You were anymore. a big drinker. Mate, I wasn't, but don't get me wrong. I did have my time. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a lot of the boys would know, especially through the Bronx and Titans <laughs> days. And when I was playing footy, it's very easy to get caught up in that environment. Um, yeah. yeah, mate. So like little things like that, like not drinking, like not doing drugs, like um, not doing not doing not being around like toxic people like having a really great community around you being around good friends and and probably like yeah that learning about the brain i don't think that's talked about enough um i think that's something that i really want to learn i think that's probably like that's going to consume most of my time to be honest behind closed doors yeah i won't talk about it that much unless there's someone that's you know, going through concussions. And that's what I mean. Like people who are coming out, like that's exactly what it's about. Like having the tools to be able to have those conversations. Yes, on a podcast form, but also behind closed doors. I think I have most of my conversations, you know, behind closed doors. You know, a lot of them have been early hours in the morning after a couple, you know, fair few beers (laughs) and and whatnot. Um, But yeah, like mate, those conversations be had and and, and I got a lot of love from my friends. So I want to be able to help them. Thank you, my man. Thank you for the listeners. Thank you for getting all the way to the end. If you got value, like, subscribe, go check out uh, Keegan's content, the potty, the Instagram, what ability as well. Uh, The Good Human Project for Cooper as well. And uh, if you got value, send it to a friend. One more time, Keeks. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, brother. Cheers.